Welcome to the final ECR Wednesday webinar of 2018, hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. Today our speakers will explore the role of the arts in science communication. The webinar will begin with the panellists sharing their stories. Then, in the second half of the webinar, we'll be putting your questions to them. To ask a question, you can type in the question box on the GoToWebinar functions panel, or you can tweet us, we are at Eli Community, using the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Finally, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording the webinar and will make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now I'll pass over to Vinod to introduce the panellists. Thank you, Emma. My name is, hello everyone, my name is Vinod Erangovan and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Göttingen, Germany. I'm also an early career advisor to eLife, uh, which is our host of today's webinar. Um, and um, I, um, I'm part of an early career advisory group of eLife, or eCAG for short, uh, where our mission is to change what we value in science and also promote responsible behaviors in scientific research. So early career advisory group members, together in cohesion with eLife ambassadors, uh, launched several initiatives in order to change what we value in science. And one such initiative is also this series of webinars presented every month, which we call as ECI Wednesday webinars. Um, and in aligning with what we change, with, with, with the changing of value in science, um, this webinar uh, represents uh, one of the themes that we explore, which is to use um, arts uh, in science communication. So I'd like, I have the pleasure in welcoming uh, the panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Louisa Bengston joining us from Max Gelbrook Center in Berlin, and Edward Duca joining us from University of Malta, and Bilga Demirkos joining us from uh, CERN Geneva, but uh, she's a professor at the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey. And we also have David Odi joining us from Minnesota. He's a professor at the University of Minnesota studying um, cellular dynamics. Uh, I welcome you all for this um, webinar. Uh, but to, before going, to, uh, going into uh, the stories of each of these panelists, uh, I would actually motivate why we started thinking about this topic um, for this particular webinar. Um, if you look into the human civilization, um, even before language evolved, um, it is art has been the medium to express our emotions and complex ideas. And that has been a very powerful medium in order to convey different messages uh, throughout several millennia. And uh, only recently, scientists have um, explored, or science, scientists and science communicators have explored the power of art in communicating um, the science that we do. Um, and one particular powerful example that I like personally is uh, actually 200 years old, uh, which is uh, in the 1820s, uh, there uh, were a group of scientists who were baffled with the idea of whether scavenging birds, such as vultures and kites, do they use vision or, or sense of sight or sense of smell as the primary um, source to find their food? Uh, so uh, one group of scientists um, hired a painter to paint a sheep, and then they put it in the middle of the ground. And they found that uh, black vultures actually use their sight to find their food and not their uh, sense of uh, smell as it was already thought. So this this has already brought the connection between arts and science, if you would ask me, 200 years ago. Um, but there are also several other projects, uh, such as uh, you know, one could use music uh, to uh, different notes of music to code uh, temperatures of different um, years uh, in order to create awareness about how climate change is happening. So this could lead to bigger policy change. Hence, um, I would say that art is a very powerful tool or powerful medium in order to actually um, communicate different messages uh, and reach out to people. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Louisa Bankston uh, to talk about um, her work in merging science and arts. Uh, but uh, before we go into the speakers, I would also like to mention we have uh, a collaborative note-taking for this webinar, uh, which is a Google Doc, uh, which uh, 
would be posted in the chat uh, over the webinar interface and also uh, through Twitter. Uh, please follow us using ECI Wednesday hashtag. And now I'd pass it on to Louisa Bankston. Hi, um, thank you Vinod, for introducing me um, and well, giving this opportunity to talk about my projects. Um, so I work at Max Delbruck Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin, in Germany. It's a research institute uh, dedicated to life sciences research, basic research in life sciences. And I'm a scientist myself by training, but turned communicator uh, years ago and um, now uh, working mainly on projects which brings public and science together in different ways. And for many years, uh, we have actually been using visuals, of course, in our all kinds of communication with the public. Um, but recently, we moved more and more into actual art projects. Um, to communicate um, public, uh, communicate science, and I've prepared sort of three case studies from the from Max Book Center, which I will call MDC um, in now the rest of my talk. So, I prepared sort of three um, case studies for uh, how we use art to communicate uh, with the public, um, and also the reasons for using this um, different uh, approaches. So, I would now um, start a um, um, presentation. I hope this works. So three uh, three case studies. So we use science as art. Uh, we also use art as a science education tool, and we use art as a dialogue about um, the societal um, implications of science. And um, in the first case, um, the reason for using science as art is um, basically we have this yearly event event um, at the Max Delbuck Center. It's called uh, Long Night of Sciences. And we have thousands of visitors, around five to 10,000, depending on the year and actually the weather <laughs> on that year, um, coming to our campus and uh, visiting us and wanting to see uh, what we're actually doing. And this is a day or a long night, basically full of uh, all kinds of events. And one of these um, traditionally since many years is the scientific image contest, because we realized that scientists actually do all this um, mainly fluorescence um, images in, in the labs, and these are beautiful, and uh, people like to look at those. So uh, we made a contest out of this for the scientists, so they submit the most artistic image. Um, we have a selection committee, which selects the 20 best ones um, by different criteria, and then we show these um, at this annual event, and then the public uh, votes for uh, which one is the winner. So. Um, the reason for doing this is basically first uh, we uh, we give scientists sort of um, a way to recycle their uh, images in a way so they can use it uh, basically they not use publication this can be uh, you know shown in a in different setting as well still the the results uh, we also have now several schools who have this images as posters in the biology classrooms so um, we think this is a really nice and very low threshold approach um, like to make people curious about what's behind the picture. So uh, the two pictures that I'm showing here, the first one is actually a spider and the other one is the mouse sperm um, under the focal microscope and with different proteins being stained. So it's visualized in different colors and it's simply beautiful. And um, we hope and we also see the effect of people asking, okay, so what's behind it and how do you actually do it? And why is this picture being taken and so on? So this is sort of the first case study. So using science as, as art. Um, the second one, we uh, recently conducted a project uh, where we used science, uh, art, sorry, as uh, science education. So there was a Berlin-wide project called Lab to Venture, where school kids uh, were supposed to do kind of like a company-like, um, well, like, sort of like a company project. So they had to like submit a project, which was, was then financed. They had to make a business plan and uh, read certain milestones, make like real uh, project management uh, around this project. And um, from the MDC side, we asked uh, students, one school, one neighboring school, to uh, make art on the topic of genome editing. So um, genome editing is one of the methods that of course every, almost every lab at the MDC is using, um, the genome editing with CRISPR-Cas. And uh, we want to, of course to talk about it with the public and we thought maybe with schools, this is a good approach to make the kids to actually think about the, like understand the method and or think about genome editing per se. And this is the result. It's not, um, I mean, it's like actually quite some nice art pieces. Uh, a lot of dystopias that came out of it, which is a bit of pity. <laughs> but um, in total, uh, 
from the talking from this project, from uh, talking with the students throughout this project, um, the, at least they understood what uh, genome is, what genome editing is. Um, basically, the the concept of genome uh, became familiar for them through um, making this art project. So um, this was our approach to um, art and science education. Um, and then the third project, um, third case study, is sort of the, the largest uh, project we have done um, so far and uh, one that we are very, very proud of because it's really fantastic, actually. Um, we had an artist in residency um, at the MDC. So in the in the framework of the European, uh, European funded project Orion uh, for promoting open science, we funded an artist residency on topic of, again on genome editing. We had 40 submissions from um, all over the world. We teamed up with the state um, state festival, which is an um, artist uh, art science agency in Berlin, um, and uh, together we selected um, selected an artist um, that we thought had submitted the nicest concept. The 40 submissions came from actually from all over the world, from 15 different countries. And we selected Emilia Tika, a Finnish uh, artist based in Berlin, who works with the approach of speculative design. And uh, Emilia um, worked in our labs at the MDC, do, doing actual science along with our scientists and use this experience in her uh, art piece, which is about rejuvenation, longevity, and CRISPR. And if we have two minutes, I would like to show uh, a teaser she made because her work was already exhibited at Ars Electronica in September this year. And the, uh, the, um, the ready exhibit is now, uh, to, can be seen at the State Gallery in, uh, in Berlin. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have any images from the exhi exhibit itself because it's still, um, it's, it's just basically opened and uh, we're still in the process of making documentation. But I would like to shortly just show the, the, the movie because um, it it's shows how, um, this is actual work that Emilia has done in the lab. So. So these are um, neurons. These are actually um, pluripotent, um, reprogrammed um, stem cells, adult, <laughs> adult pluripotent stem cells, uh, which Emilia was um, differentiating into neurons. And um, basically, in the end, um, these neurons um, formed um, sort of mini brains. Um, and um, these were then also uh, these neurons were also engineered with um, with CRISPR. So this is like forming networks and just to, in the interest of time to, well, I hope this is working. So this is already the, the mini brain formed by the, by the cells. And it's human neurons. And um, basically, uh, Emilia's idea was um, to talk, uh, to use um, this project to talk about the implications of CRISPR for our, um, for our life, like um, so, she created alongside with those uh, movies. Uh, she also created an object, an inhalator, where you uh, basically can uh, inhale the Yamanaka factors together with uh, DCAS9, and um, then we can we can stop the sharing of the screen now. By the way, um, so. Um, an object where you can inhale the Yamanaka factors together with the Cas9, and this basically reju rejuvenates your cells a little bit. And this is something that can be used like as an everyday object in the future. So um, everybody can do it, and everybody can decide uh, whether they want to do it or not. And she tells a story in her art of a couple where uh, he decides to do it, and she doesn't, and what implications it has for their life. And at the opening of this, um, this exhibition. We also uh, made a scientific symposium in the art gallery. Um, we're really the uh, scientists from MDC who work on, on well, not on genome editing, but on basically any um, on the sequencing technologies, on actually understanding the genome uh, itself. We're presenting the work and uh, we're discussing with the public um, the, like how 
how how possible is this? What um, Amelia was envisioning in her work, and what does it what can it mean for the society, and how should scientists uh, think about it, or should they even think about it? Just uh, how does it compare to the to the normal medical approaches we already have, and so on? And it was a fantastic event because it really through this approach through through art and having this in this um, gallery, we reach totally different audience that we would have otherwise with a normal symposium in our scientific premises so um yeah um that's basically we're very happy with uh, using art as approach to um to reach different target audiences and uh, um yeah <laughs> I, really, I i guess i would like now um to hear some questions to talk more about it thank you louisa uh, thanks for sharing that art is a dialogue uh, in the process of communicating science uh, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Edward Duca. Uh, he is going to share us how to foster multidisciplinary collaborations and also talk about um, communicating science, uh, not at the institution level, but at the whole city level. Uh, Edward, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm a lecturer in science and innovation communication at the University of Malta. I uh, run a research magazine for the university, um, loads of events all around the, the country and also a science indoors festival called uh, Science in City. I'm also involved in a number of EU projects, um, science, arts and education and some other things as well. Um, I wanted to start off with some things about festivals. Um, festivals have uh, studies have shown uh, 5.6 million people were reached in 2008 by them and um, the impact uh, festivals can have on a city um, if they involve the community especially it can be six significant and city marketing and uh, urban regeneration strategies are really using them. Um, we're seeing science and arts festivals spread throughout the whole world the World Science Festival in New York, for example, starts off with a big um, performance um, related to science and arts. When I went there, I saw them uh, performing um, Einstein's readings from Einstein's letters. Uh, the Manchester Science Festival, um, I visited them as well. They had a, a big music band, a, a pop, alternative music. The whole hall was filled and packed. Um, and they had various arts installations, a sleep lab, for example, in a mall, uh, really reaching new audiences with, with the approach. Um, and there are initi initiatives, and yeah, these are also using science and arts and doing exhibitions and so on, trying to involve com com communities to, to even India. So it's, it's a really worldwide phenomenon that we're seeing. A bit more about Malta to put things into context, uh, we're a very, very small island, um, around 316 square kilometers, 27 kilometers long, 470,000 pe people living on it. Um, so with the Science and Arts Festival that we do, uh, we do reach, we get about 30,000 people to come and do reach about 6% of Malta's pop pop population directly every year. And uh, we do surveys every, every year to assess the impact of the festival and what audiences we're attracting also. Um, we do, um, so Science in the City, our motto tries to be good science and good arts. We've won the EFFE um, Arts uh, Cultural Festival label, and we're also part of European Researchers Night. It's an EU-wide phenomenon every last Friday of September, and it happens all around uh, Europe. Um, uh, and it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing initiative. So in Malta, we work with NGOs, we work with industry, with companies, with different government bodies. Um, we get hundreds of volunteers um, through various calls to actually participate in it. And what, what we've done is various, has resulted in various spin-out projects, um, Puppet theatre combined with um, science, for example, called Kids Dig Science. We run that throughout the year. That started at Science in the City. Um, it's basically a short puppet show um, on always on a different topic. Uh, we have some very clever um, performers involved in that, and then that's followed by hands-on ex experiments. 
again, like Luisa was saying, uh, using it for um, science ed education mostly, but also providing an entertaining event, which I think is, a, is an important quality. Um, by hosting um, science in the city instead of in a university, but in a city, we're having a greater economic impact. Um, we do fill out every single bar and rest, rest restaurant in, in Valletta, for example. And by having it in the streets, it's really easy for, for people to engage with, with things. And in fact, you see thousands of, or tens of thousands of pe people seeing an, an artwork. Uh, if it's in the streets, if you do it inside the building, it's going to be a much lower amount. Um, I'd like to talk about um, now some examples, but um, I don't want to just talk about positive things we've done, um, but also some things that didn't go quite as well. So we've, we've had an artwork, for example, it was called the Ecological Street Furniture, one of our first. Um, I think we the, the idea behind it was to do street furniture um, that were clear, uh, minimalistic, and inside them there were different Maltese habitats to raise awareness about ecology. Um, so you can interact with, with the furniture, but also um, it com 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 communicated um, to its audience. However, um, the relationship between the festival or organizing team, the scientists and the artists, didn't happen multiple times. It didn't happen um, over a long period of time. And that meant that the right ecological habitat wasn't co collected, com compromises had to be made, the lighting was incorrect, and people um, didn't notice it as much as it, they, they could have. Um, a year later, we had a, an exhibition called MA Squared. We filled out half of the capital city's uh, main square. So the capital city of Malta is a 16th century Baroque city. So a 400 year old history, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a fantastic playground. Um, and we built a giant maze. And people could explore different aspects of science and arts as they went from room to room. However, uh, the relationship between the scientists and artists and designers kind of it broke down. There was uh, project management again wasn't strong. And um, because of that, um, the relationship ended up not having the, the, the people who came still enjoyed it, um, to be honest. That's, that's what our survey showed. But it didn't have um, as big an impact as it could have. Um, and that was, again, because um, you need to build a positive supporting relationships between scientists, artists, and some form of mediator also. Uh, make sure the finances happen on time, provide advice and solve problems as you need. Um, also, having clear project obje objectives and not overdoing it. I think the problem with a May Square it was trying to fill half a square um, in, in a capital city. It was huge, lots of different scientists and artists involved. So it was diff difficult to manage the, relation the relationship between 20, 30 pe people all at the same time. So not overdoing it is really important. Um, also, having a clear target audience and the platform that they will be using. So the, the artists, scientists need to understand who's coming and what Science in the City in Malta means as a festival. It's a street festival. It's meant to be fun, engaging, have some education behind it as, as well. Um, so one of the, um, a, a simple project that we did was called I'm Still Here. This was a theater performance. Um, it was a monologue. One actor, uh, Charlotte Staff Staffrache, uh, from Teatro Anon, and she collaborated with an animation artist. They were exhibiting around this theater various um, art, various science, scientific images. Again, it was uh, fluorescent images of neural of, of neurons, three three images through the brain, because this was a play about dementia, and the research was being done um, trying to study what 
um, compounds could actually help um, elevate this, this, this condition from people who suffer from it. So it was a very beautiful way to, to show that. And in fact, she got, there was a good marketing team behind her. She got uh, hundreds of people to come in, in multiple sessions throughout the night. Um, and it worked. Um, it had, it was a simple monologue, good execution, clear project ob objectives, and it wasn't trying to overachieve. Uh, we have had more ambitious projects. Uh, one of our largest uh, is called Light Pushes Stuff. It was inspired by um, quantum physics. This is a, a big EU project, like uh, Louisa had mentioned. Uh, uh, this, 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 this one was called Hot. Um, it takes a phenomenon in quantum physics, very abstract, and turned it into by having the scientists and artists meet over almost a two-year period. They developed this artwork. It worked very simply, huge LED bulbs. They had sensors at the bottom that um, when you put a light torch underneath them, the bulb would move up and down, change colors. And it was a whole host of 30, 50 light bulbs doing that in front of our parliament, which is one of the busiest sections of the festival. So about 10,000 people pro properly saw it. Around that, we had a um, computer, uh, touch screen based game for children. We had the comic also, we had the scientists, artists, and science com communicator who managed the project there as well. And it worked because there was that science com communicator there seeing what the artists wanted, what the scientists wanted, how they were going to execute even these highly complicated ideas in a simple way that was in interactive. We found that being interactive. Uh, is really what people want from our festival. And it also came from us as the festival management team, dropping in, making sure things are being bought on time, um, making sure that all the project deadlines are being stuck to. The only, I think, uh, fallout we have is that uh, we did speak to pe pe people and had a qualitative ev ev evaluation of the, of the artwork, but we didn't have a full study around it, um, which I think is an important thing to do. It's very important to evaluate what you are doing and to monitor your process and the impact it's having on the scientists, on the artists, and on the, the citizens that are interacting with it. Um, a bonus rule that I want to leave off with is, when possible, do sign contracts and other legal doc doc documents to manage the expectations of everyone involved. So that's a bit about Malta, a bit about what we're doing here. We're doing a lot of other things. Um, but I think my 10 minutes are up. Um, and uh, it's been really fun. And I'd really like to hear some questions from the people listening in on us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. Thanks for keeping the time. And also thanks for sharing the insights of failures. I think we learn more from failures um, and collectively, we could uh, do things better. Now, moving on from um, city level and the national level, um, how would a multinational research organization um, use arts to communicate science? I'd like to invite um, Bilger Demerkus uh, to tell us um, the work about arts at CERN. Bilger, please. Hi. Hello. Um, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, be on this panel with such interesting uh, other speakers. Um, so I have been on the panel of uh, uh, the arts program at CERN for about three years. And uh, we have three different programs uh, that, have be, that we've been running since 2011. When this program was um, founded formally. Before then, we also hosted artists at CERN. But formally, um, the program had a curator starting in 2011. Uh, we've had two curators since then. And both curators have been very successful in connecting uh, scientists at CERN with artists. So uh, one of our programs is the Collide program. And this is a residency award up to three months to invite artists. Uh, to CERN, and uh, which um, uh, where they get a, a scientific partner here at CERN, uh, where uh, they follow this, they can follow the scientists around, 
uh, learn uh, what the scientists are doing day to day, uh, learn um, sometimes even the mundane things about what the physicist is doing. And then after that, uh, they're free to uh, take that into an art project or just be inspired by it. Um, we've had uh, very interesting artists who said, I actually want to be part of it. And they worked underground uh, to cable the detector. So we had one, one, one artist who, who volunteered um, to actually do uh, technical work and work with technicians underground and said uh, that he now touched the detector and that brings him closer to you know, the collisions. Um, so, but also we've had uh, 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 artists who worked with theorists and worked with concepts at a very uh, fundamental level. We have the uh, Accelerate program, uh, which is a country specific award for artists uh, from different geographies. Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, countries will fund their own uh, artists to come and uh, work with uh, CERN. So this is also a residency program. And then the most common program uh, is a short visit. It's an exploratory visit uh, um, where a guest artist can spend uh, from two days up to a week with uh, visiting CERN and talking to people here. We've Actually, we've had guest artists which um, have come two or three times as well. Um, sometimes they have some further questions and they can want to come again to further explore that idea. Uh, I've worked with uh, some people. For example, one of the artists that I work with is Goshka Maguka. And uh, it, it's, been, it's, been, um, it's been very interesting to work with her. What I've my personal experience from all of this is that uh, this interaction between arts and science both explore what makes us human and brings us uh, closer to a mutual understanding of uh, how we can understand each other. And um, in the end, what we're trying to do is understand why are we here? How do we get here? What, how do we make sense out of it all? Uh, for example, one of the things is um, I worked on a I work on a detector up in space. It's a particle detector called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, and it's on the International Space Station. And as I was talking about this experiment in, on the International Space Station, I always say, "Okay, so you went to space in May 2011. So these particles go through our detector, and when we look at our data, we see." these particles interacting with our detector. And, and then she stopped me at some point and she said, you're, you're, you're talking about this detector as if it's part of your body. And I said, that's actually true. And she made me realize that I do feel that it is a part of me. And I, I because I've worked with this for so, for so long, it, it feels as if the data it collects is no, no, no more different than my eye or my ears. No. So that, um, and I would not have, I would not have discovered that on my own. <laughs> so, uh, how much how much does does this program bring to artists? I don't know, but it it definitely adds to the scientists here at CERN. <laughs> um, which brings me uh, to a quotation uh, by a very famous uh, Fermi Lab director. Um, they asked uh, Dr. Wilson uh, back in the '60s whether this accelerator research had anything to do with uh, developing weapons, and he said that it doesn't. And he said, it doesn't have to do with anything to do with that, but it has to do with the question, are we good painters, good sculptors, good poets? It has to do with all the things that we really venerate and honor in our country and are patriotic about. In that sense, this new knowledge has all to do with honor and the country, but it has nothing to do with directly defending our country except to help it make it worth defending. And I've, um, I've seen, in a way, that this arson arts and science program adds value in that sense. So I've, so I, I, in this, from this perspective, I have a little bit of a cringe every time somebody says use, use arts. Because yes, I understand the value of arts as a tool, but at the other side, I find the value of arts is much goes beyond, greatly goes, goes beyond a tool. And uh, it, it is so much more than a tool. It, it, it adds value. Um, and uh, so one of the, and there are many art projects coming out of CERN. 
So here's one, Broken Symmetries. Uh, this is a recent uh, curate, curation by our current, uh, uh, the current curator, uh, Monique Bello. And this is a collaboration between CERN, uh, Fact from Liverpool, uh, CCCB from Barcelona. And it will be touring. Uh, now it will be touring, it's ju just opened at Fact in Liverpool and will be touring uh, Liverpool, CCCB, uh, Nantes and Brussels. So there it is, Broken Symmetries. Which, uh, broken Symmetry is a concept that came from, uh, comes from physics, but this is uh, how, how the many, many, uh, many visiting artists have their own take on this project and it's their uh, exhibition now that's going to tour. And um, also at my university, uh, we have next year, we're, we're now curating an uh, arts uh, project uh, for the researchers' night. Uh, we will be exploring this uh, arts and science connection uh, from the perspective uh, that uh, we, we are on a journey together, arts and science together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bilga. Uh, that was very humbling to learn arts can be more than a tool and it is actually humanizing the science of uh, science within ourselves. Um, building on um, how art can make science feel within our body, I would now like to invite David Odi to talk about how you can engage with your body uh, or use it in order to express uh, science uh, within and uh, through art. Uh, David, please. I think if you know, um... I'm going to try to share my screen here, if that's OK. Yeah, so uh, as Vinod was saying, uh, we've been working on embodying science. This has been a collaboration between myself and uh, Carl Flink, who's the artistic director of a, a dance company in Minneapolis called Black Label Movement. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering, and Carl's a professor of uh, theater and dance. And uh, we came together through a, a longer story than I can share today, but basically through uh, foresight of Ann Waltner Institute for Advanced uh, Study at Minnesota, putting us together really, and seeing that Carl's approach to dance involved, as you can see from this image, pretty direct and sometimes even somewhat violent physical contact uh, resonated with my own view of what life is like in a cell with the tremendous violence of thermal collisions and water moving on average at hundreds of miles per hour. Uh, I thought it would be a window or an opportunity to convey, as we've heard others say, to the public and educate uh, them, uh, the public, about what life is like in the cell because we don't normally experience that. Um, as has been said earlier, this in one sense is a complete failure. We've never done it. We've been working together for 10 years. But what happened instead was in fact more interesting to both of us. We started to use the collaboration as a way to embody my ideas, which uh, we could then represent the cell uh, physically, in this case, we constructed a uh, chain link fence inside of an abandoned torpedo factory in northeast Minneapolis. And inside was this chain link fence was uh, padding and so forth. So we could uh, we could run around and collide with the walls and collide with each other in a way that would embody the violent collisions of molecules inside the cell. And yet, amazingly, order emerges out of this violent thermal bath that we're in. And we thought this would be cool to display to the public. Uh, but really what it turned into is a way to test out different scientific hypotheses that different scientists might have about how life works at the molecular cell level. And so uh, I'm going to show a short clip here. Hopefully it'll play, but it's uh, and hopefully the audio will work. But if it's not, I'll just move right on, which is that I invited two uh, scientists that I know from outside the University of Minnesota, Enrique De La Cruz from Yale and Dyke Mullins from UCSF. And we got together and started to brainstorm with our bodies, though, um, the different ideas that we had about how the presence, the high uh, concentration of proteins inside the cell might affect the ability of two molecules, two proteins to interact with each other, uh, so-called crowding effect. And so um, let me see if this video You see the plays. three three or four of science, the four scientists. Can you hear that? Talking to each other. No, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do that. Well, no, no, no. This is why it's not working. So when you're trying to tell a, a room full of people right, your idea for how right, uh, right, molecules right, might behave right, in a cell, right, uh, right, you really right, have to, right, to think it through. When you start to actually try and tell people how to move, you think, well, do I really understand what I'm saying? David was saying, 
you know, he could probably do this in a simulation. It would take longer. Um, and there, you know, but once he worked out, he might be able to get a few things more. But as, as we were discussing earlier, um, at a minimum, this is going to give us an idea of, of what, where are the, the, what are the trends are, where, where changes are happening that, that, are, that are worth looking into a little bit more carefully. So hopefully you're able to hear that and see it. Um, so what that led to was uh, actual uh, kind of simulated results of how uh, molecules might be influenced by the presence of other molecules, their ability to form bonds. So that led to a collaboration uh, within my lab then of actually doing real computer simulations that are rigorous by a method called Browning Dynamics where we could actually recreate that. But the initial genesis of that idea came from this body storming project. And kind of to compare and contrast then this uh, computer simulation with the human movement based simulation, um, certainly to be more precise and accurate and scientific and all that, you will eventually want to use a computer to get precise numbers. But it's amazing how quickly you can rapidly prototype and build a model by using human movers, particularly when you have uh, a professional dance company like Carl's involved. An important part of this is that it can go the other way too. The science started to impact the art and it started to uh, uh, draw Carl into new artistic directions. And I'm sure he'd be happy to speak to anyone who wanted to learn more about it. And he produced a piece called Hit, which has uh, received critical acclaim, uh, performed in Chicago and reviewed there by Chicago Tribune and other places as well. And uh, it's a direct outcome of our collaboration. So now it's going both ways art uh, helping science and science helping art. And we've discovered that it's not just particular to us, it's multicultural, it's international. We've taken it to various places around the world, including the NCBS in Bangalore, India, for example. Uh, and it just latched on right away. I didn't see any barriers. If anything, I felt like Indian culture that we encountered there was even more open to this than we'd experienced in the United States. And then if you're interested in learning more about this, um, Carl and I have done a couple different uh, TED type talks. So we did a TED Med talk in 2013 at the Kennedy Center for per Performing Arts in Washington, DC. We've also written an article in Trends in Cell Biology on our collaboration. And uh, we've collaborated with John Bohannon who started the Dance Your PhD uh, project. And uh, John and Carl together did the very popular dance versus PowerPoint TEDx Brussels talk uh, that you might enjoy is a lot of fun and also thought provoking. So I guess a few points that we've learned and I'll wrap up is that um, we can rapidly prototype our models using human movement and it allows us to integrate our bodies and our minds together. So often in science, we just disembody ourselves uh, without needing to, we, we don't have to do that. That really helps with deconstructing models and understanding how they work and building intuition. It allows us to not only study the things kind of an outsider perspective, but have that insider perspective that Bilga was talking about where the detector was an extension of her body. Uh, we have that physical sense already. Uh, some other things going the artistic direction is we have to appreciate that in terms of creativity, that artists are oftentimes much, much more creative than scientists, even though a lot of scientists are very creative. It can lead to new art making and it can more of an approach to interdisciplinary and holistic education where we don't separate out say the art class from the science class. And furthermore, we've engaged a broader community of patients who are uh, suffering from brain cancer and ex intend to extend that application and opportunity further as well. So those are some of the things that we're doing with the body storming project at the University of Minnesota. Thank you, David, uh, for this nice sum up of um, our discussion. Um, now I'd like to open up for questions. Um, so we, I'll use my um, host privilege um, as to ask a question that uh, one of my colleague or collaborator uh, asked uh, me uh, that why aren't artists in this particular webinar or in this panel? Are there any answers from uh, the panelists? Well, I guess I don't know what's uh, the experience of, of um, my fellow panelists, but um, usually the art projects we uh, are involved in uh, are the ones that 
we initiate somehow. So as a research institution, um, we are the one who have certain, well, we have money, I guess. <laughs> That's maybe the very first <laughs> step. And like, so when we when we have a project, we have already financial means to um, to carry it out. And then we're looking for for artists to collaborate with. Uh, if the artists are school kids or professional artists, or um, if it's just the artists in the labs, <laughs> basically what the project I was showing. But basically, it's the institution who's calling for um, for collaboration. And I don't know how many of those, maybe maybe you know how many of those collaborations originate from the artistic community itself, um, where artists are actually, you know, like ringing the door at the research institution and say, like, let me in, I want to, I want to work here. Um, so maybe that would explain the lack of artists on this panel. Any so I have, I, I know, well, at, at least there are plenty of uh, art institutions who have contacted CERN. Um, Ars Electronica, uh, several um, art houses around Europe have contacted CERN. Um, so I, I'm not convinced that that is money. It's uh, maybe, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Our experience is different. Well, I'm not, I'm not really saying it's the money. money I'm just saying basically there's a money is topic a problem. or project. But, so. hmm? Hmm? No, I, I'm just basically saying that usually, I mean, from my experience, it's like we have we have a project in mind. We already have something that we can, we, we look for artists. So it hasn't happened to us as an, as an institution. Of course, we're not CERN. I mean, we are just a small life science institute in, in Berlin. But um, it has never been the case that actually artists have been coming to us and saying, let us in. We want to work with you. It's more like we say, OK, look, we have this possibility. And who wants to come? So um, yeah. just saying that the, the there's a different approach, but uh, surely, I mean, uh, I can imagine um, CERN is, um, it's just a different um, different story in a way. Maybe, maybe it's not, well, I don't know. I mean, even at my university, I've had artists approach me or my colleagues, but maybe because it's physics, uh, maybe it's, um, I don't know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because we're looking at some very fundamental questions about nature that people are somehow curious about something because we, you know we ask very very fundamental things and maybe people are i'm going off on a limb here i am, i'm not i don't know what i'm talking about I'll, I'll, i i retract uh, i retract okay so, so in just 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 about the month experience um it, it's I, I i think the point that we are uh, institutionalized I think all of us um, that that does make it gives you a certain more ability to apply for EU projects or various funding schemes and so on that helps empower you to do stuff and we try to be as inclusive as possible involving different stakeholders different types of artists having things more community based art um, so we don't get you know elitist science at one point, elitist started at, at another point and make something even more elitist. Um, we, we, we were trying to bring in new audiences um, by trying to involve more NGOs and communities. And we've, we've worked with a number of different organizations. I think in the festival we worked with about 90, 90 different ones and 10 to 15 of those are NGOs. So, so uh, I, I think the, an organization doesn't need to make an effort to reach out to uh, other com, com, communities and those that might not have such access to funds and, if possible, help empower them also. I'll just, I can make a brief comment. I just would be that um, and mine's a little different because I've focused on one specific collaboration, but in that 10 year period, Carl and I have, Carl Flink and I have actually become very good friends. And we trust each other, and I, so I think um, another way to think of it is to, is building trusting relationships was one of the things I wanted to share with the group today. And I think part of that discovery process for me is understanding what life is like from the perspective of an artist. And to the earlier point that Luisa was making, um, they do need to be compensated at some level. They can't sustain it without that. Um, 
at least the United States. So I guess I would encourage scientists to think uh, realistically about trying to serve that um, need and that um, it, it's actually pales when it compares to our budgets for science, uh, but it's still uh, not zero. And so I, I would encourage building those trusting relationships to understand what their needs and wants are uh, as well. And um, allow yourself to go into a different space than you're comfortable with. Um, thank you. Um, the next question is actually a bit about uh, mental health. So how does art help improve the mental health of early career researchers? Any thoughts on that? I, sorry, I just have to jump in right <laughs> Um, I think anything that's more than just your lab work uh, or just your task at hand that happens uh, during your PhD uh, is good for mental health. And uh, I think art is like, if that's what people are interested in, I mean, everybody has different interests. I mean, it could be sports, could be arts, can be anything, uh, partying, I mean, whatever. Um, but I think anything that happens um, that's relates to your work, but it's put in larger context and shows you that people are interested in what you're doing and it has some kind of impact. It's always good for your mental health. So um, any kind of activity, any actually any science communication, any outreach activity, uh, whatever um, flavor, um, it's really beneficial for the mental health of PG students. I'm convinced of that. Yeah, I can say, I think it's, I agree with Louisa 100%. Uh, it's important to have fun, uh, and what we're doing is is fun, but it's not mere fun. Uh, we're also engaging and learning and and building relationships at the same time. So I think that conveys to everyone there's a bigger picture here than just the specific science project that we're doing. That's it's just part of a bigger, a larger scheme. Yeah, yeah. Just to pitch in there, uh, th those are some really good points. I think that. Uh, the arts, for example, are a really powerful way to explore mental health teams, to raise awareness about them, and to engage and involve people with them. Uh, it's a, it seems like a very appropriate medium also. Um, for early career researchers taking part in the science and arts project, it's an opportunity to meet others, to understand others, to do something maybe outside of the routine. And from a personal level, for me, when I was doing my, my, my PhD in genetics, um, first year was really trying, um, and I definitely wasn't in a, in, a, in a positive mental state of mind, and exploring writing, organizing events, exploring working with others, um, these sorts of projects really helped me um, to be able to complete my, my PhD, actually. I think if I didn't do these things, I, will, I, I, I would have, you know, I could, or I could have given up at, 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 at some point, which I think is something to point out. Like, if someone starts a PhD, finds it isn't for them, and wants to change, that should be maybe more acceptable in the academic com, com, com community. But also doing these forms of interdisciplinary projects can help motivate you and provide that, that joint fund that was mentioned earlier. Um, it's, a, it's a really important point. Thank you for that. Um, so I think we have a lot of questions and comments, um, uh, but I think I'll take this question and then ask your closing comments. Uh, so the question is, have we reached a point in time where most scientists and researchers respect the arts as an equal so I take that as your closing comment for this webinar. Um, so please go ahead. But um, I must say that um, it's not so easy. The artist residency we had was the first one we had at MDC. Um, it was quite challenging for, for all. It was quite a clash of cultures. And it took some time to develop a common language. It wasn't found, it was really developed. And it was good. Uh, it was really a shaking up um, experience for all people involved. It was really the, um, um, it was basically the, the artistic vision met the, the reality of, the hard reality of scientific fact and uh, the cultures clashed a bit in a good way in the end. But uh, it was quite challenging and I don't know if you could, I think it's very personal uh, 
personal sort of uh, take on whom you see as equal in what and I don't know if this question can be answered like that but I think definitely um, through the artist residency to this just creating this space where the artists and scientists could actually meet and work together uh, mutual respect was definitely developed um, and I think more of this should happen all the time everywhere and it's, we have just have to respect each other that's that's it um, I'll, I'll take the, the second slot then um, so I think I've seen um, everything um, through I think seven years of managing uh, loads of different projects um, and I, the key that Louise raised of mutual respect that's really key um, I've seen it from both ends both the artists um, just like meeting uh, scientists once taking learning what they need to learn from the scientists and then doing whatever they they want to with it without re-engaging the scientists without involving them in the artwork um, even when there are scientists expressed interest to be involved um, that they, you know they, they wanted to remain part of it um, I've seen that happen and I've seen scientists expect uh, artists to communicate their their science uh, to do that you know 100% accuracy and all these other um, various co conditions and not uh, accepting or not um, being understanding towards the, the needs of the artists and their need to, to, for artistic expression. Um, so I think it really comes down on a person level. I've seen artists and scientists really work, work well to, together, go out for drinks, um, enjoy themselves, have a relationship beyond the project also, or work on additional projects afterwards when that relationship is, is healthy. And the mutual respect, um, having also a, a dialogic process, that it's a two-way process, and it's a continuous one, uh, not just a one-off meeting, I think are, are, are really key also. Okay. There we go. Do you want to comment on it? Um, yes. Um, well, I'm also an artist myself. I play the piano and I do other things. But, um, so I was brought up as a, you know, I, I'm artistically inclined myself. So, um, but in a way, the language of physics is mathematics. So one of the, one of the greatest minds, I would say, of physics, Professor Richard Feynman said that if, if you cannot explain it in words, you don't understand it, which is a huge statement to make. Um, and I had I had issues with the statement until I started talking to artists. And then I've come to believe it as well. Because talking to artists, they've challenged me. And that challenge was amazing. And I, I've come to understand that I recognized that if I if I don't ex if I cannot express it properly in words, no, I don't really understand it. And a lot of the mathematics that we use, we cannot explain. Which means that, at a very fundamental level, we are still missing uh, key elements in our theories. So to me, it's been a very fulfilling experience, and I find that uh, artists are not just equals, but also uh, complementary to our work. And Dave, do you want to finish off? Sure. Um, yeah, I've had the same perspective now with, as Bilga, which is that if I can't explain my science to dancers so that we can choreograph it, then maybe I don't understand it. And maybe two different scientists would choreograph it differently, which now is the basis of a scientific discussion. And I would say I have, in terms of respect and so forth between the two communities. I have N equals one. This is one collaboration between me and Carl. But it's gone on 10 years and we're good friends. And I guess I would encourage people to follow that path to, um, to build, build friendships, real relationships with people and understand what their needs are. And that will um, be mutually beneficial. It's gone both ways for us. I've helped him and he's helped me. And that is why we keep working together. 
All right. Thank you very much. Um, that's a great insight or a take home message uh, for the, from this webinar. Uh, we are slightly over time, but um, I'd like to again thank all the panelists for uh, sharing their insights and all the audience for keeping us um, with interesting questions. Um, and uh, we will have uh, webinars. Uh, so this would be the uh, last webinar for 2018. And we will have uh, webinars in 2019 uh, on different topics that are relevant to early career researchers. Uh, some of the topics are uh, shown as a word art here. Um, so stay tuned with us and uh, we'll see you uh, in 2019. Um, thank you everyone for joining. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.